that is our cupboard, our storehouse. People don't have enough money to go into town, so they get food from the sea. Today, on this day, we draw the line and we say no more. We are telling you, no drilling in our backyard. If you don't listen, we will take you to task. Sunrise over the East Cape, the most easterly point of New Zealand. Situated in New Zealand's North Island, the East Coast stretches roughly 350 kilometres from Apodiki in the north to Gisborne in the south. It's a remote and rural area of the country, and what it lacks in economy and population is more than made up for by the beauty and riches of its land and sea and the warmth and spirit of the people. Residents here feel at one with nature and rely on it for sustenance and recreation. But this coast has a dark story because in 2010, their lifestyle came under threat. On the 1st of June 2010, um, Jerry Brownlee announced on the, on the mainstream network news um, that he had awarded a, a drilling permit, an exploration permit, sorry, uh, to Petrobras, which is a company, a, a oil company from over in South America. June 2010, um, when on the late night news we saw Jerry Brownlee signing off on a uh, right to explore for oil. It was the first that our iwi had ever known that this kind of stuff was going to be happening and the permit was awarded for the Rokumara, what's known as the Rokumara Basin, which is straight up there. Uh, this was all done in the dead of night and none of our iwi leaders knew that it was happening so as a mum of three uh, and living here in a community that relies heavily on uh, the sea for our everyday sustenance and survival. Um, it, it was really uh, shocking news for us. Um, there's a few issues where they come up with us. There's one is around consultation. We didn't know that this was happening, yet it's in our backyard. Why is that important to us? Well, um, Te Whānau Apunui, um, as a collective, um, have legal title for 97.5% of that whenua inside their tribal boundary, so it puts us in a, quite a unique situation. Article 2 of the Treaty of Waitangi um, puts us also in a unique situation where um, that uh, article uh, allows us or gives us the right uh, to be managing our assets, our taonga, um, how we see fit. Um, and dropping an exploratory well inside our, ta our taonga is in a way that we see fit. John Key, you got mail! Aotearoa's not for sale! John Key, you got mail! Aotearoa's not for sale! Waitangi Day 2012, and New Zealand's Prime Minister John Key is confronted by protesters angry at offshore oil drilling and the sale of state assets to companies like Petrobras. Although Petrobras tries to portray a squeaky clean image, like in the promotional material you're watching now, a quick look at their safety record makes the issues and concerns held by those opposed very real indeed. Petrobras, o desafio é a nossa energia. Over 1.3 million liters of oil leaked from an underwater pipeline run by Brazilian oil company Petrobras. At the time, the Brazilian government said it would take a decade for the area to recover. And today, this is what some areas around Guanabara Bay look like. What was once covered with thick green mangrove, housing crabs and fish, now just black mud, no life left in the soil. A scene of dead nothingness. A scene of dead nothingness. For us, it's about the long term future of our. everybody's mokopuna. I mean, and now on our beach today here in Parekaheka, you've got. I mean, we've got people from all over the world come here to play because it's summertime. Um, the children are, are in the beach. 
it's the salvation for a lot of our young people and our young families who who are on the dole. They're not they're on the dole because there's no employment here. Um, but in that in that uh, despite that position, they can feed their families. They either feed their families from the sea, uh, diving or fishing, or they go hunting. That's a frightening prospect as well, because it means that those hunting grounds are at threat, and um, you'll see a whole lot more um, impoverishment, a whole lot more uh, poverty, depression, and all of those frightening statistics will be compounded if those hunting, if our cupboards uh, are um, are threatened. Um, so for us, that is our that is our cupboard, our storehouse. And for many families around here, uh, within the tribal boundaries of Te Whanau Apuni, it's still the primary uh, storehouse, food house uh, for our people. People don't have enough money to go into town, which is, town is all Portuguese for the people around here, um, to buy food. So they get food from the sea. I mean, we're 180 kilometres away from the nearest supermarket. We can't just go down the road every day. A packet of bread costs five dollars here. A bottle of milk, five bucks. So we can't. And then the gas is expensive. So you can't. We, it's not an everyday thing that we go down to the shop and buy, kind buy food. We can't. We just there's no money. Can't afford it. Hey, that's the reality back here. And so the reality is, is that they continue to, um, they rely on on the food source that's out there in the sea. People of the coast rely on the ocean for food, and now as well as East Coast locals, decision makers in Wellington are asking important questions. The national government has embarked on a very ambitious, very aggressive oil exploration and advertising strategy for New Zealand. We're selling ourselves very cheaply to international oil drillers like Petrobras, like Exxon, like Apache, Tag Oil, because this is a misguided way they think they can grow the New Zealand economy. Now, ironically, at the same time as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was happening in the Gulf of Mexico in the United States, the government was signing deals with Petrobras to allow them to explore off the Rakuma Basin. To the Minister, why has a foreign oil company been permitted to explore and drill for oil in deep water, when according to the Ministry of Economic Development's review of offshore petroleum operations, there is, quote, a lack of environmental permitting regime. Does the Minister know that the catastrophic oil leak in the Gulf of Mexico occurred in an exploratory oil well at a depth of around 1,500 metres, roughly half the depth of the Raukumara base? How can the government be sure that there will not be a catastrophic leak such as the one that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico? What resources or infrastructure does the New Zealand government have to deal with a catastrophic oil spill? that was not available to the American government or BP oil in the Gulf of Mexico. What is the government's contingency plan if there is a catastrophic oil spill? Uh, Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Acting uh, Minister of Energy and Resources, those matters would be addressed at the time. Of course, one, uh, because that happened to one well doesn't apply, it happens to all. Uh, we have equipment and stores strategically located around New Zealand, but the, probably the key point for the member is the plan is regularly evaluated and re-evaluated to ensure it meets changing risk profiles. Should the pattern of oil exploration or production change, Maritime New Zealand would look to ensure that appropriate equipment is available to respond to that change. Unfortunately, on the 5th of October 2011, New Zealand authorities found out just how underprepared for an oil spill they were. The wheels are coming off. The Rena's containers are going overboard. The big oil slick has hit the beach. And worst of all, the hull is showing the clear first signs of breaking up. New Zealand's worst ever environmental disaster at sea. High winds and strong swells are hampering efforts to staunch the flow of oil gushing into pristine coastal water. Off the coast of New Zealand, this container ship strikes a reef, sending oil washing onto beaches. Worst ever environmental disaster. New Zealand's worst maritime environmental disaster. The Rena was our worst ever marine environmental disaster. It is a tragedy for the Bay of Plenty, Mount Monganui, Tauranga. What we saw with the Rena was a very slow response, poor communication, a very bad initial response. We've seen Maritime New Zealand woefully unprepared, underfunded, without enough equipment to deal with a moderate oil spill. 
The arena should serve as a wake-up call for New Zealand and the government that we don't have the capability to deal with what's a moderate oil spill and we definitely don't have any capacity to deal with a well blow-up like we saw in the Gulf of Mexico. Well it should serve as a warning for the rest of the country. That disaster happened in Tauranga. The, um, within I think it was five days the oil reached out all. There was only like a teaspoon and on compar in comparison to spills like the Gulf of Mexico. So if something like the Gulf of Mexico was to happen um, and GNS who are the um, uh, the crown geologists and scientists have told us that a spill and an accident out at the depths that they're wanting to drill in the Rokumara Basin would be unmanageable. So a spill like that in comparison to the arena um, would be absolutely devastating, not just for Tapano Apanu but the whole eastern seaboard. We've had a taste of that with the arena um, and we don't like it. We, and we don't want, um, you know, that's just a, a fraction, a minute view of what could happen if, if uh, something was to go wrong with a deep sea oil drill. It's risky, it doesn't benefit the New Zealand economy as some pundits would have us believe, but ultimately it's the Kiwis uh, who love our beaches, who want to protect our ocean, it's the marine environment which is at risk of a catastrophic oil spill. Petrobras has said that there will be no money coming to the local economy. Um, there will be no jobs because they need specialised people because it will be out deep. Um, and there will also um, be no oil. The country gets 5% benefit of the, of the deal. We carry 100% of the risk. And there's, there's just, just the, the risks far outweigh any benefits that we can see. It's clear the government is putting the environment second when it comes to deep sea oil drilling, but they're also putting the taxpayer at risk of paying a massive tab as well. At the moment the government makes oil drillers liable for any costs of an accident, however they only require them to have up to $30 million insurance. Clearly this is inadequate when the cost of the deep water horizon could run into the tens of billions of dollars. We fully believe that we have, within our power, within our hands, we have the power to change whatever destiny we want to change. The whole range of levels people can engage to stop deep sea oil drilling. Putting a sign up on your gate. You use protest as a tool, and, and that tool is to raise awareness. It's as simple as wearing a t-shirt. It's as simple as having a bumper sticker. Communities and their councils, through the lobbying and the businesses involved, the investors, the banks involved, the insurers. Petitions, filling out the Greenpeace petitions or jumping online. There's a whole lot of Facebook pages you can jump onto and um, keep abreast of what's happening. We need to send the government a message and people can do that by emailing John Key, emailing the Energy Minister, sending a submission on the government's EEZ bill. Join in, the, in any protest, the protests are going to be ongoing. Ultimately people need to send a political message, it's not okay, we love it, we want to protect it. We have to, for our children's sake and our grandchildren's sake, and that's not just us as Māori, but you know, New Zealanders generally, people who love to call Aotearoa their home. Us uniting together when it really, really matters. All great leaders of all the tribes come together, let us be as one. And from that, we will prosper together.